Welcome to the semifinals of the research papers competition. Um, so a couple of quick logistical things. The format of this competition is that we will have seven authors present 15 minutes each, and after their 15 minute presentation, we will have 10 minutes of Q&A um, from mostly our judges, but if we have extra time, then we will have audience Q&A. And so I wanna quickly get started so that we have enough time for our authors. I will quickly introduce our judges. We have Megan Cheka here with us, CEO, founder, Stathletes. We have Brian Burke here with us, senior analytics specialist, ESPN. And then you just saw him speak. We have Dr. Toby Moskowitz here, Dean Takahashi, professor of finance at Yale, as well as principal at AQR Capital. Okay, then let's get started. We have Laszlo Toka. Uh, hey, welcome all. My name is Laszlo Toka. Thank you for the introduction. I'm an associate professor at the Budapest University of uh, Technology and Economics in Hungary. And uh, this is a joint work that we did uh, last year with two of my uh, students, PhD student of mine, Pega, uh, and uh, Togzan. Uh, he actually graduated in January, so now she works at Nokia. And the postdoc researcher, Jan from Belgium, uh, who is a data analyst for Club Bruch as well. And uh, what we set out to solve is basically uh, optimizing decisions, uh, player decisions, in attacking phases of soccer matches. All right, so motivation. Uh, we see um, two types of questions from, uh, from coaches and uh, uh, soccer practitioners uh, uh, in general. Uh, the first one is uh, how to model uh, the, the, the value of uh, different actions, uh, on-ball actions of players, uh, so that we can actually incorporate uh, long-term rewards uh, in the model. This is uh, one uh, huge uh, domain of research. And the second one is basically how, how to improve those uh, values, how, how to improve, uh, improve the potential of, uh, of actions or a series of actions uh, to take uh, uh, place uh, in the matches uh, so that you know, more goals are scored and um, you know, more matches are won. So we tried to uh, answer those two questions uh, with a solution uh, that's uh, maximizing expected goals. And as, uh, as I said, or as, uh, as it's uh, written in the title, uh, we used uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, to do that. OK, uh, problem statement. So um, soccer. Uh, has a couple of challenges uh, when we try to solve uh, uh, this task. First is uh, uh, the first challenge is that uh, football, uh, soccer is a low scoring uh, or sparse reward game. Uh, as you know, uh, matches are relatively long, nine, 90 minutes, and uh, uh, usually only a few goals, goals are scored uh, in those matches. And so it's, uh, it's really hard to uh, basically base the model on, on, on solely on goals uh, in order to evaluate uh, what the players did uh, throughout the whole match. The second uh, challenge is that uh, uh, football is, uh, well, soccer, sorry, uh, soccer is, uh, is a highly dynamic uh, sport. Uh, and, uh, well, you might see uh, acts or actions from players that, uh, that don't, don't seem to be uh, too important. Uh, on the short run, but uh, it turns out after a while that uh, actually uh, those actions open up uh, potential uh, situations for goal scoring. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really complex uh, uh, to model, and uh, the, this, this is a huge challenge uh, in our quest. All right. Uh, the third one is uh, possession. So um, what, what's, what's a possession is, uh, uh, it's not really defined. Well, uh, there are several papers uh, that define possession, but uh, uh, they're not uh, doing the same thing uh, as, as a definition. And uh, uh, we, we actually had to address this challenge as well, how to actually uh, model a series of actions into one, uh, into one uh, possession or into one uh, episode of, uh, uh, of actions. Um, so that's, uh, that's the third one. The fourth one is, is again, the, the complexity of the strategies. Uh, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, 
uh, is, is rooted in the fact that uh, basically in, food, in soccer, it's not always the case that the uh, ball is going from one player directly to the other. And uh, that's, uh, that makes the modeling a, a little bit uh, difficult. All right, so uh, given these challenges, how to model uh, actions, uh, attacking actions of uh, soccer players, and how to uh, uh, you know, find the optimal strategy, that's, uh, that, that, that was uh, the, the task uh, to solve. Well, in order to solve this, uh, we got inspired by uh, the different uh, outstanding uh, research papers that were published uh, uh, in recent years. Uh, well, all of them are basically addressing uh, different questions, uh, uh, either around the interpretable analysis of, of actions uh, on, the, on the pitch surface, or what if analysis kind of questions, what could have happened if uh, some player had done something uh, differently. And, uh, and the third uh, type of uh, research uh, that we got inspiration from is, is basically uh, the definitions and the, the calculation of uh, different uh, reward functions uh, on the short and long term uh, that uh, you know, the actions uh, uh, are leading to. All right, so what we did is basically we combined several uh, great ideas from these papers. Uh, we improved them a little bit. And uh, we also use the re deep reinforcement learning on top in order to model uh, and optimize the decisions that uh, soccer players make. All right, um, I'll have a few slides about the technical details, what we did, and uh, uh, soon I, I'm going to turn to the actual use case and the application of the results. All right, so uh, this is a high-level overview of uh, the uh, policy network uh, that we put together. Uh, so it's basically a variational autoencoder, and it serves the goal of uh, modeling what has been done in the historical data set. Uh, so feed the, we feed the uh, tracking and event data uh, to this uh, policy network. Uh, we, we do it uh, uh, with the fine-grained data, both in terms of uh, uh, spatial and in, in temporal, temporal sense. Uh, so uh, we, we just uh, divide the pitch uh, into one meter by one meter uh, you know, pixels, and, uh, and we feed uh, 11 different channels uh, for each uh, of these parts. Uh, these channels actually uh, contain uh, different tracking uh, uh, data related information that we de derive uh, solely from uh, tracking data. Uh, so it's uh, like uh, position of players and the ball and uh, velocity and uh, uh, those uh, kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, information. Uh, we also label we put labels on them that uh, come from uh, the event data. So it's, uh, uh, for example, the outcome of the actions, whether it was successful or not, that, that, uh, that is derived from the event data that's uh, joined or merged together with the tracking data. And uh, uh, by training this encoder uh, network, uh, we'll have two, uh, you would say, latent variables uh, or outputs uh, uh, of, uh, of this uh, neural network. The first one is, uh, the selection surface, with, which gives you uh, the probability distribution for the ball to be at in the given f in the in the subsequent frame. Uh, well, we, we're um, using a tracking data of uh, 25 uh, frame per sec. Uh, so uh, what you see here, those are spots. Well, the lighter the spot is, the higher chance that the ball is going to be there in the next frame. And then we have another output uh, of this encoder network, which is the success surface, which, uh, which is given by or learned by the event data. And it gives uh, the probability of uh, this action to be successful. So uh, the, the, the team is, uh, is keeping the possession, then it's uh, considered to be successful uh, if it's a pass. All right, um, sorry. Um, uh, there's a third output, which uh, will be useful. Uh, I will talk about it. Uh, a little bit later, uh, we're gonna reconstruct the frames uh, after we optimize uh, the actions with the reinforcement learning by this decoder part of the network. All right, so before uh, we uh, turn into the optimization, we first uh, need to define the rewards uh, for the reinforcement learning framework. And we did that. Um, we actually uh, defined uh, different uh, reward functions in different uh, phases of the possession, uh, so uh, we we, we, separate, uh, the, uh, we separately uh, uh, treat the transitional phase and the build-up play and the established possession phase and the attack phase. Uh, those are basically uh, defining different phases of the possession based on where the ball is. 
at a given time. And uh, for each of these phases, we have a different reward function. And then for uh, modeling the, the whole value of, uh, uh, the, the, the total value of the whole possession, uh, we add these rewards up. Uh, we sum them up for the whole possession, uh, also by um, applying a discount factor. And uh, what you see the, uh, the lowercase r is, is basically that uh, it's, it's the reward uh, given uh, state s uh, and uh, uh, performing a, an action a. All right, uh, this EPO is, uh, uh, it ranges between minus one and plus one, plus one, um, indicating that uh, there's gonna be a goal uh, at the end of the possession and minus one if, uh, if it's uh, a goal conceded after the end of the possession. All right, so uh, we run the reinforcement learning, uh, we, we train it, and uh, it actually modifies the selection surface uh, in, order to, in order to maximize or at least improve the EPO uh, for each and every possession in the game. And here you see an example for uh, one attack in which uh, there is a bad decision by uh, the, the, the player who shoots the ball. Uh, instead, of, uh, uh, instead of just uh, passing the ball to that uh, center forward, uh, he's uh, performing a long range uh, shot, which is not a good decision. And uh, actually our uh, reinforcement learning model uh, highlights this. And, uh, uh, you see that uh, on this figure, uh, the EPO ev evolution uh, somehow diverges uh, for uh, the optimal uh, strategy, which would be the, the forward pass to the center. All right, so we did this for all the matches, uh, for all the teams in the Belgian Pro League for uh, one and a half uh, years, I mean, one and a half years uh, worth of matches. Uh, and we found that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we found that uh, uh, an average team, uh, on average, um, and uh, yeah, playing uh, with the average opponent teams, uh, will uh, win the game uh, by one and point goals uh, instead of losing it by one goal uh, in reality. So uh, th this this is a bold statement, and uh, this means that actually, if uh, one uh, team applies the strategy that's uh, being suggested by the reinforcement learning model, then uh, they can turn over uh, well, most of the matches from uh, uh, being uh, the loser uh, to being the winner. Uh, in order to back this up, this bold statement, uh, we made sure that uh, uh, we evaluated everything correctly. So uh, we actually applied uh, three different evaluation methods, uh, important sampling, doubly robust, and the simulation. Uh, in which uh, the decoder part uh, of the network actually takes, uh, uh, takes, takes a role. And uh, that you, that's what you see on the center uh, figure. Uh, well, basically, all three methods indicate a uh, similar thing, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is the fact that uh, the optimization actually works uh, for, for, for most of the uh, teams and for most of the matches. All right. Um, so this was the technical part, and now let's turn to uh, the usage or the um, application scenarios of, uh, of this uh, whole framework. Um, so um, we know that it's, it's uh, important uh, uh, to, to turn the results into applica uh, applicable uh, insights uh, for coaches or uh, you know, strat strategy makers. Uh, so well, we did uh, uh, some kind of uh, 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 simplification steps uh, in order to do this. So uh, this, on this slide you see two figures. Uh, one figure uh, uh, on the left uh, shows you the behavior policy, uh, actually um, the occurrences of different types of actions uh, done on average, uh, for, uh, calculated for all the teams in the league. Uh, and uh, what you see on the right hand side is basically uh, the optimal uh, behavior, the outcome of the reinforcement learning. Uh, and you see that uh, certain actions are suggested to be uh, done more frequently, while other uh, actions at other uh, pitch zones are suggested uh, to be uh, done less uh, frequently. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, the output of uh, the simulation. So, uh, sorry, the reinforcement learning. So what we did, uh, what we did uh, for uh, the coaches to be uh, to, to, to apply this uh, kind of uh, uh, results, 
is that uh, we refined the reinforcement learning for all the specific teams individually, uh, and uh, we indicated how, how frequently uh, different actions uh, should be taken at different uh, zones of the pitch. What, what you see on the right-hand side is basically a, a, a graphical uh, interpretation of what should be done for these two uh, specific clubs. Uh, so probably th this, uh, this is interpretable for uh, most of the uh, uh, soccer practitioners. Uh, basically, it's, it's like uh, uh, you should, uh, for Club Brugge, uh, you should uh, do more backward uh, ball movements on the wings, uh, uh, but uh, less backward uh, uh, passes in half spaces, et cetera, et cetera. All right. In order to uh, uh, break this down a little bit more, we also uh, uh, cut uh, the possession into different phases. And we did the same thing uh, for the different actions. That's what you see here, again, for uh, uh, two uh, Belgian clubs. Uh, so for example, if, if you uh, look at Ustende, which is at the bottom, uh, the, the model suggests uh, uh, to lower the, uh, the shots in the attack and the established possession and do some uh, more uh, uh, long balls or short passes instead. All right. Um, Here's uh, the list of the takeaway messages. So what we did in this work is uh, basically we analyzed the behavior policy uh, with, the, with the, an autoencoder network uh, of uh, Belgian teams uh, throughout uh, hundreds of games. And uh, we applied the reinforcement learning in order to optimize or at least uh, improve their performance uh, in terms of uh, uh, goal scoring, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of attacks. And um, yeah, we hope that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good framework uh, which gives uh, actionable uh, insights uh, for soccer practitioners, even for evaluating uh, players and improved scouting. Uh, thank you. Test. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, really ambitious. Uh, um, uh, read your full paper. Uh, first question is the 11 channels in the model, do those just represent offensive players? Uh, no, all, all the players, uh, but the whole framework is for attack, uh, well, um, you know, attacking uh, strategies. So we, we, have, uh, we, we have the positional data, the tracking data for all the players in the, in, in the team under uh, evaluation and also uh, the players of the opponent team. Okay, um, next question is the, um, the delta, the difference, the an improvement that you could make by going from like negative one expected goals to plus 1.5, right? So two and a half goals per match, is that per match or per season? No, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's per match. So that's really big. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and um, like overwhelmingly big. So I'm, I'm curious, so the reason I was asking about the, the, the original 11 channels is, uh, are you confident that defense is properly modeled? So I would expect that, you know, you're, you're going a certain number of steps into the future, and so anticipating how the defense is gonna reconfigure given those decisions um, might, <laughs> might be part of the reason you got such a big delta. Yeah, well, you're absolutely correct. So uh, this was meant to be a headline of the paper at uh, this 2.5 uh, goals uh, for. And uh, uh, well, the thing is that we, we don't model uh, the defensive actions of the opponent. And uh, uh, you're right, if, um, you know, if, if the opponent actually adapts to uh, the improved uh, strategy of the attacker team, then uh, this, night, uh, th this might not happen at the end, I mean, in terms of uh, scored goals. Uh, we, we didn't consider uh, this, so we actually uh, uh, made the assumption that uh, the defensive actions are, are not uh, changed uh, throughout uh, um, you know, the reinforcement learning uh, 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 training and uh, then application. Okay, um, very quick last for me is the, uh, there's no time step element. It's, it's just a sequence of steps. There's no like T in the, in the model. Time. Uh, yeah, well, so we, we have, um, as I said, we have uh, 25 FPS of granularity for the tracking data. 
Uh, and the, uh, well, the, the output of the encoder uh, network is, uh, is basically uh, you know, estimating a probability for the ball movements for the, for the next uh, frame. Okay, and uh, the similar thing is done for the reinforcement learning. Okay, so it's, well, if I understood correctly, your question was whether we have a continuous time model or not, right? Well, in the, in the optimization phase, in the re reinforcement learning phase, yeah. are you just, you're anticipating just te steps? Like yeah, discrete steps, steps? yeah, okay. discrete steps, yeah. I see, thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed your presentation too, as well as the paper um, and you know optimal decisions rather than just valuing a play. Really interested in hearing your thoughts on um, scouting, how the application, I saw that as the last on your list, but I think that's really interesting as well, if you'd like to expand upon that. Yeah, um, so, well, when you try to actually apply the optimized strategy in terms of uh, player actions, uh, that's uh, been suggested by this uh, reinforcement learning framework, uh, then you might end up in a case in which uh, your players are not able to do, uh, not, not ab able to follow your, uh, what, what you dictate as a, as a coach, right? Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is one kind of application for uh, player evaluation. Uh, the other, well, somehow um, linked to this is that uh, you can actually uh, look at uh, individual players, whether uh, they're uh, getting the same rewards in their, in their behavior uh, policy actions uh, uh, or, or, or they're far away from the, uh, the optimal suggested actions, right? So you, you can compare uh, players, uh, for example, on the, on the two wings, whether uh, they're doing the same uh, thing as the optimal um, policy suggests or one of them uh, is lagging behind. I mean, in terms of rewards, uh, uh, the actions that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the players uh, one of the players is, uh, is, is getting to the team or getting to the possession is, uh, is not so uh, great as, uh, as, 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 as it could be. Okay, uh, and uh, for scouting, we meant that uh, uh, if, if you end up in a situation which uh, you, you don't have the players uh, to actually uh, apply uh, what, what, you, what you have to do uh, in terms of uh, optimal uh, policy, then, um, well, you, you can... Uh, use uh, the results uh, as, uh, as, as inputs for your scouting. Um, so first, in terms of Brian's question about the, the, I would say, shockingly big effect that you get, <laughs> I think it's not just the defense, but my guess is that calculation is also assuming that the other team doesn't adopt the optimal uh, strategy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, of course. so the two and a half is a combination of both no defensive response and the other team is doing something suboptimal as well, right? Yeah. The, the normal behavior. Exactly. So, but, but following up on that, another thing that uh, might be interesting to add to this model or to see if your model can do better than was it would be if you took within game probability changes. So when you look at the decisions that people make, right, for the uh, within game, when, uh, you know, the, there's these contracts that bet on the probability of the team winning. And at each decision node that you, that you identify, you can actually see what the change in probability of those contracts looks like. If you added that up, would it come even close to, to two and a half? I, my guess is it would be a lot smaller than that, but it'd also be another data point you could use to, to calibrate your model, right? Because that's gonna, that, you, don't, you don't know what the counterfactual is, but you do know what the change in the probability of winning is from each of those actions. That data, I think, is, is gettable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, seems, uh, it seems like a, yeah, good advice. I mean, uh, um, we, we actually uh, try to incorporate uh, uh, different things in the rewards. So if you look it up in the paper, um, you'll have uh, different uh, reward functions uh, for these uh, different phases of, uh, of the possession. Uh, so it's... Uh, it, um, well, the other, the other interesting thing you could do, too, is you could actually look at when you get big differences between what's optimal and what actually happened on the field, you could also translate that into the probability of, win of winning the game, right? Right now you're doing it in terms of just the, some, some, the metric that you've created from plus one to minus one, right? But you could actually translate that, I think, using the uh, betting markets into uh, how much that affected the, 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 the outcome, right? Uh -huh. Maybe you can do that with the current data you have, but just accumulating it and making your own assessment, but you could actually match that to, to betting markets. I, would be pretty interesting, I think. Okay, yeah, thanks. We'll do that. Uh, 
um, wrap up. Okay, well, thanks a lot.